van my kant af, grijs en pies, ek is so dankbaar, dat jy op die Vatersdag ook uh, ingeskakel het, en dat jy hierdie diens saam met ons deel. Ons het verlede week klaaggemaak met ons reeks, wat ons genoem het Crash. Dit het gegaan oor acht weke, en uh, in die laaste boodskap verlede week het ek ook gepraat aan die einde oor eenheid. En ons het stilgestaan by, die, by Johannes 17, nee. Uh, en, en, en ons het gesien hoe belangrijk eenheid vir God is. Die thema verlede week was Godse wingerde. En ons het gesien dat elke gemeente is een wingerd van God. En hoe belangrijk die eenheid binnen in een gemeente is. En vanmorgen gaan ons bykie aangaan, dit is nie deel van die reeks nie, dit is een aparte boodskap, maar ons gaan bykie aangaan op daar die thema van, van eenheid. En ek gaan vanmorgen gaan ons na een uh, uh, video teaching kyk van pastor Rick Warren, een persoon wat die heren in my leven ontzettend baie gebruik het oor, oor soveel, soveel, soveel jare. Een van die uh, meest invloedrijkste pastors in die hele wereld, as ek dit so kan stel, denk ek persoonlik, hy is die meest invloedrijkste pastor in die hele wereld en God het om geweldig gebruik. Hy treed toevallig af oor uh, so paar maanden in september, as ek het nie mis het nie. En hier die boodskap wat ons nog gaan kyk vanmorgen, pas perfect aan, denk ek, by dit wat die Heere vir ons wil leer. Die thema van die boodskap is a united family. Ons sê so baie vir mekaar, dat ons as kinders van God, binnen in, binnen in hier die gemeente, is ons a faith family. Ons is gebind aan mekaar dier Jesus Christus' bloed. Ons is deel van die selfde wingerd. Ons is ingeplant op die selfde wijnstok. En eenheid is so ontzettend, ontzettend belangrijk. Uh, Dat is die een ding wat ek in my leven geleer het en ek denk wat soos een paal boe water staan en dit is dat die heilige gees beweeg nie waar daar nie eenheid is nie. So waar daar nie eenheid in een gesin is nie, waar daar nie eenheid in een kerk is nie, waar daar nie eenheid in een span is nie, daar beweeg die heilige gees nie rarig nie. En daarom is eenheid verskrikkelijk belangrijk. En, uh, en daarom is het so nodig dat ek en jy rarig met een oop en ontvankelijke hart sal luister vermoorde. Want eenheid hang nie van een of twee persoene af nie. Eenheid hang van elk een binnen in die groep. As ons praat oor eenheid in die familie, dan hang het af van elk een binnen in die familie. As ons praat van eenheid binnen in die gemeente, dan praat ons daarvan dat het afhang van elk een in die gemeente. Elke lidmaat in die gemeente dra by tot die eenheid van daar die gemeente. So kom ons maak ons harte oop en kom ons maak ons harte ontvankelijk vir dit wat die Heere vanmorgen vir ons wil sê. Jemelse Vader, Heere Jesus, dit is vir ons een ontzettende voorraag om vanmorgen op hierdie weise te kan vergader en om ook te kan omgaan met die woord. Dankie dat ons in hoosjep voor die kon staan, dat ons in hoosjep voor die kon buig. Dankie dat ons weet, u hoor ons. Dankie dat ons weet, u kyk diep, diep binnen in ons harte in. Dankie dat ons weet, u verstaan ons en u, u weet wat van ons gemaakt is. U ken ook die struggles in ons leven en En dankie dat ons daarom nie over masker te dra voor en nie, maar net ons self kan wees, net kan eerlijk wees. Vader, ek wil vir u besonderlik dankie sê vir, vir die ministerie van, van Rick Warren. U het vir hom oor 40 jaar geweldig gebruik in die kerk en in die koninkrijk. U het om geweldig gebruik in soveel mensense levens. En u het om vir soveel jare in my leven gebruik. En ek wil vir u vanmorgen baie, baie dankie sê het afhoor. En dankie sê dat ons ook vanmorgen hier die boodskap kan, kan kyk en kan luister wat hy op sy hart gedruk het, wat, wat spot on is vir ons gemeente waar ons vanmorgen is. Ach jyre, ons kom dan ook nou en dan maak ons ons harte oop en ons vraag dat in elk een van ons harte sal beweeg en met elk een van ons sal praat. Spreek jyre, die diensknig en die diensmacht luister. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today as we look at God's Word for our daily hope, we're in part three of a short series that I'm calling The Awesome Power of Vision. And I want us to look at Christ's vision for us, Christ's vision for a unified family. You know, the night before Jesus died on the cross, he took the 12 men that he'd been training for his entire ministry 
to a place where they could share the Passover meal together. Now, that place was called the Upper Room because it was on the second floor of a building, so it was an upper room. These 12 men had been with Jesus for three and a half years as they trained to be the leaders of the church. Now, during the Passover meal, Jesus redefined the Passover with new meaning to become the Lord's Supper. And During the Lord's Supper, Judas left the room to betray Jesus and to have him arrested. Now, so Jesus knows that he's going to be dead and buried within 24 hours. So he knows that whatever he's going to say now would be his last words before death. Now, you know that the last words of dying people are always extremely important. And Jesus shared his most intimate thoughts in this passage. What Jesus said in the, his last words before the cross are found in the book of John, verses or chapter 13 to chapter 17. Now, those five chapters in John are called the Upper Room Discourse. And this week, I want to urge you to spend the week reading and rereading John chapter 13 through 17, because it's packed with powerful spiritual truth that we desperately need, particularly in these days. Now, in those five chapters, the two themes that Jesus spoke the most about uh, were, number one, how much he loves us, and number two, how much we must love each other in the church. In fact, love is mentioned 21 times. Let me just show you a couple of examples. John 15, verse 9, just as the Father has loved me, so as I have loved you. Now you must live in my love. John 15, 12 and 13, I'm commanding you to love each other with the same love, the same kind of love that I've loved you. And here's how to measure that kind of love. He says, the greatest love you can show is when you lay down your life for friends. And that's exactly what Jesus was going to be doing in the next few hours. John 15, 17, again, this is what I'm commanding you to do. You must love each other. You get the point here? He keeps coming back to the same theme. I love you. You got to love each other. Now, after Jesus shared his final words, he prayed his final public prayer before going to the cross. And that prayer is recorded in John chapter 17. And I want to start today with it because it shows us, Christ lays out his vision for us, his family, the church. And Jesus prays uh, for us in John 17. John 17 verses 1 and 2, New International. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the time has come. In other words, it's time for me to go to the cross. It's time for me to die for the sins of mankind. Glorify your son so that your son may glorify you. And in the first eight verses of Jesus' prayer in John 17, he gives a ministry report to the Father of all that he's done with his disciples in the last three and a half years. And then in verse 9, he prays for them. And then he prays for all of us who have come to faith in Jesus because of them. Did you know that Jesus prayed for you right before he was arrested and sent to the cross to die for you? John 17, 9 to 11 says this, I'm not praying for the world, but for those you've given me because they belong to you. And now I'm departing the world and I'm leaving them behind, Father. So protect them by the power of your name so that, so that, listen, they may be united as one, just as we are one. And let me point out that this is the first mention of unity among Christians in Jesus' prayer, but it's going to be the primary theme of the whole prayer. And what was on Jesus' mind the most as he got ready to go to the cross was his own family, the church, and that we would be united in love after he died and rose again. He mentions it several times in this prayer. In John 17, verses 20 and 21, Jesus prays for you. He says this, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but all for all who will believe in me because of their testimony. That's you. And my prayer is for all of them, that they too, that's us, will be one, unified with each other. Christians uh, uh, prove that we're uh, uh, who we are by being one with each other. Jesus said, just as I am is in you and you are in, and just as you are in me and I am in you, so they will be in us and the world will believe that you sent me. Now again, just as Jesus is getting ready to die, he's most concerned about what his followers in the church are gonna be 
unified in love. It's uppermost in his mind. This is the primary vision he has for us. It's what he prayed. It's what he wanted. If something else was, had been more important to Jesus, believe me, he would have mentioned it in this prayer. So what I want to do in our time together today is look a little bit closer at Christ's vision for us, a vision of unity, because it's obviously important to him. Now, I don't have time to show you all the verses uh, that talk about unity in the scripture, but I will tell you this, that in the New Testament, it has more to say about protecting unity among Christians than it has to say about either heaven or hell. Did you know that? The Bible in the New Testament has more to say about Christians loving each other than it says about heaven or hell. In fact, God says so much about this, this uh, concept that I'm gonna have to split this message in half and teach it in two parts. So today what I'm gonna do is give you a quick survey of what the Bible says about the importance of unity in the church and why it matters so much. We're gonna look at what Jesus said, what Paul said, uh, and, and what the first church did. And then in part two, we'll look at the specifics of how we're to fulfill Christ's vision for us in the second part. So today I wanna summarize what God says about the importance of unity among believers in about a dozen statements. And because of that, I'm gonna go pretty fast and uh, I'm gonna cover so many verses that I'm gonna limit my commentary on many of them. We're gonna just let God's word speak to our hearts, all right? You ready? Here are 12 statements that summarize all that the New Testament says about unity. Number one, my unity with other believers is the proof that I'm saved. My unity with other believers is the proof that I'm saved. John 13, 34, and 35 says this. Jesus is talking. I'm giving you a new commandment. You must love each other. You must love each other in the same way that I have loved you. Your love for one another will be the proof to the world that you really are my disciples. You prove that you're a Christian, not with a bumper sticker on your car or not by any other action. The Bible says the proof that you really are a Christian is that you love other Christians in the church family, all right? Number two, write this down. The Trinity is our model for unity. The Trinity is our model for unity. Now, Jesus explains this in verse 11 of John 17. He says this when in his prayer, Holy Father, Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that, listen, so that they may be one with each other just as we are one. I love God's word translation. It says it like this, so that their unity may be just like ours. The Trinity is the model. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in harmony and unity with each other. The three are one. And the Bible says that's the way we're to be in the church. We're to be unified as one. Number three, Jesus' last prayer, very last prayer before he goes to the cross was that we'd live in unity. John 17, 21, my prayer for all of them is that they will be one just as you and I are one, Father. That just as you are in me and I am in you, so they will be in us and the world will believe the world will believe that you sent me. Did you notice that Jesus ties other people coming to Christ with our unity? He says other people will believe when they see Christians loving each other in unity. I love it in the message paraphrase translation. It says this, verse 21, my goal for all of them is to become one heart and mind. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, they, may they be one heart and mind along with us. Then the world may believe that you sent me. This is Jesus' vision and this is Jesus' goal for you and for me and for anybody who claims to the name of Christ. Now, in the next verse of Jesus' prayer, we learn the fourth principle, and it's this. God gives us his glory so that we'll be unified. God gives us his glory so that we as Christians will be unified. John 17, 22, he says, I've given them, talking to Christians, 
the glory you gave me. So that, here's the so that, it's a henna clause in Greek, so that they may be one just as we are one. Now listen, what this means is this. The purpose of God's presence in your life, the purpose of God's power in our lives is to make us more loving, not more harsh, not more opinionated, not more stubborn, but more loving. He says, I gave them your glory so that we may be one and they may be one just as we are. Do you want God's glory in your life? Do you want God's power in your life? You wanna feel God's presence in your life? Jesus says he gives his glory, that's his power, to those who lay aside secondary differences with other Christians, the secondary differences, the things that don't really matter, and live in unity with other believers. Now the next verse gives us the fifth truth about unity. Our unity, God says, is our greatest witness to unbelievers. Our unity is our greatest witness to unbelievers. That's verse 23. Jesus prayed this, may they be brought into complete unity so that, there's another so that, so that the world knows that you sent me and that you have loved them even as you have loved me. Now, did you notice this is the second time that Jesus connects the unity of Christians to winning the world to Christ? He's saying, that the world will not be one, W-O-N, to Christ, until Christians are one, O-N-E, in unity. We will win the world when we're one in Christ. Another way of saying it is this. If unbelievers like what they see, they will listen to what we say. But if they don't like what they see, they don't see us loving each other, they're not gonna listen to what we say. Again, I like the message translation of this verse, John 17, 23. It says this, then they'll be mature in their oneness, giving the godless world the evidence that you've sent me and that you've loved them in the same way you've loved me. The evidence for atheists, the evidence for agnostics, the evidence for other faiths is to be the love Christians have for each other. Now, okay, this is just some of what Jesus says about the importance of unity. But now I want us to look at how the first church in Jerusalem, in other words, the first Christians, implemented and practiced and applied all the verses we just looked at, what Jesus said about unity. And to go to that, uh, uh, see that, we've got to go to the book of Acts, where we learn two more important truths about the power of unity in a church family. Write this down. Here's the sixth truth we learned from Scripture. Unity removes fear and creates boldness. Unity removes fear and creates boldness. What am I saying? That a unified church gives everybody more power and more courage than a divided church. Where do we find this? In Acts chapter four, verse 24 and 31, the, the, the Apostles or the disciples, Peter and John, had actually been put in prison. They had done a miracle and they were preaching in the name of Jesus and then they couldn't hold them, so they, they let them out. And uh, when they came back to the church, it says in verse 24, then all the believers united together in prayer. That brings unity. When we pray together, it unifies us. And it says, after this prayer, this unified prayer of all the people in the church, it says, after the prayer, the building where they were meeting shook. That's power. That must have been a pretty powerful prayer. The building where they were meeting shook, and they were all filled with God's Holy Spirit, and they began to speak God's message with boldness. Would, would you like to be more fearless? Does fear plague you? Insecurity plague you? Anxiety plague you? Would you like to be more fearless? Would you like to be more bold? Do you wish you were more confident in sharing your faith? Let me give you a little secret. Focus on your unity with other Christians. The Bible says when they were unified, they became bold in speaking the word of God. I want you to write this down. Division creates fear. Unity removes fear. Division creates fear. Wherever you find division, in a church, it's gonna create fear in that church, but unity removes fear. Division destroys 
vision. But there's another thing that we learn from the first Christians in the book of Acts, and it's this, write this down. When a church is unified, everybody's needs are met. When a church is truly unified, truly unified the way Christ wants us to be, everybody's needs, all the members' needs are met. And we find an example of this in Acts chapter 4, verse 32. It says there, the entire group of believers, that's the church, were completely united in their hearts and in their spirit, and everybody shared their possessions with each other. In fact, they shared everything they had. So nobody had any need. The Bible tells us in Acts 2 that this was impressive to the Christian, to the non-Christians in Jerusalem, that they had the favor of people because they said, see how they love one another. Okay, now we've looked at what Jesus said, and we've looked at what the New Testament Christians did in, in Jerusalem. Now let's look at what Paul has to say about Christ's vision for unity in the church. It's Paul spends a lot of time talking about the importance of unity in both his letters to the Corinthian church in Corinth, the home in Greece, city in Greece, and to the church at Ephesus. He says, it's, it's a big deal. Write this down. Number eight. Here's the eighth in the summarizing all the Bible says about unity. Baptism and communion are the visible signs of unity. Baptism and communion are the visible signs of unity. Both of them are symbols of our incorporation into the body of Christ. Both of them visualize that we now don't just belong to Christ, we belong to each other. If you've been baptized, if you've taken communion, you don't just belong to Jesus, you belong to others, everybody else in the family of God, everybody else in your church family. Now first, baptism is a sign that I intend to protect the unity of the church family that I belong to. You say, where's that? 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13 says this, for just as your body is a unity, even though it has many different parts, it is with Christ's body the same. He says, the church, it's just the same way. He says, we're all different. Just look around in our church, obviously we're all different, but we form one body. We've all been baptized into Christ's body by the same spirit, no matter whether we were Jews or Greeks or slaves or free men, we have now all received the same spirit. He said, no matter what your culture background is, your racial background is, your religious background is, your national background is, he said, doesn't matter. He says, we've all received the same spirit. We've been baptized into the body of Christ. He says, it doesn't matter what your background is. Now you are unified with every other Christian, regardless of your distances, differences, which means I have more in common, for instance, with an Asian woman who's a believer in Christ than I would have in common with an American male, six foot two uh, uh, man. Uh, we have physical commonalities, but my real commonality is with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, Paul points out that not only baptism, but also taking communion is a sign of unity. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17 says this. When we eat the bread that we break together, talking about the bread of communion, isn't that sh sharing in the body of Christ? And by sharing in the same loaf of bread, we, come one, we become one body, even though there are many of us. By the way, let me point out, the Bible also says that you should not take communion if you're out of unity with anybody else in your church family. The Bible says that you actually uh, eat judgment on yourself. You should not take communion if you're out of fellowship, out of unity with anybody else in your church family. Now here's the ninth thing that God says about unity in the church. Write this down. Focusing on our common purpose is what creates unity. Focusing on our common purpose creates unity. We find this in 1 Corinthians 1.10. I love this in the New Living Translation. Dear brothers and sisters, I appeal to you by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ to stop arguing among yourselves. He's talking to church members. Stop arguing arguing among yourselves. Doesn't matter what you're arguing about, just stop arguing among yourselves. Let there be real harmony 
so there won't be any divisions in the church. Paul says, I plead with you to be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. If you're taking uh, notes, circle that word purpose. God says, I want you to be united in purpose. Paul's saying, be purpose-driven in your church. Not program-driven, not pressure-driven, not power-driven, not pleasure-driven, not popularity-driven, not personality-driven, not politics-driven. He said, be united in purpose. That's key. All right, just a couple more. Here's the next insight, number 10. Summarizing what the Bible says about unity. Unity begins when we realize we're incomplete without each other. Unity begins when you and I, Christians, realize that we are incomplete without each other. We need each other. God wired us in such a way that nobody gets all the gifts. I don't have them all, you don't have them all. That's why we need each other. 1 Corinthians 12, 20 and 21, and verse 25 says this. Yes, we're all different parts in Christ's body, but there's still only one body. Okay, so yeah, we got different gifts, we got different background, we're different races, we're different sizes, shapes, we're different gender. Yeah, we're, we're all different parts of the body of Christ, but we're still just one body. So he says, the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. He says, there must never be any division in the body allowed. This is the scripture talking. There must never be any division in the body allowed. Instead, all the members must care for each other equally, equally. In other words, showing equal care. The Christian church is the place of all places there should be equality and justice. We are to care for each other equally, not show preference, not show prejudice, not show bias. There must never be any division in the body, he says. Instead, all the members must care for each other equally. By the way, this is your job. It's not just a pastor's job. It's your job as a Christian to protect the unity of your family, your church family. And the Bible talks about removing anybody who creates division or disunity and to ensure that your brothers and sisters are treated equally with equality. Now, related to this is the next verse, 1 Corinthians 12, 26 and 27. Listen to this. This is another part that enhances unity in the church. When one part of the body suffers, every other part is to suffer with it. And when one part of the body is honored, every other part of the body is to rejoice with it. Together, not individually, you are the body of Christ. You're not the body of Christ by yourself. I'm not the body of Christ by myself. Together, we are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of that body. And you're a necessary part. So he says, when somebody's suffering, you need to be empathetic. And somebody's going through pain, be empathetic. Somebody's hurting, be empathetic. Somebody's frustrated, be empathetic. Empathy is a key to unity. You may write that down. The more empathetic I am, the more uh, we're, I'm going to be able to build the unity of the church. Okay. Number 11, Jesus died to unite us, not to divide us. That's the why, why it's so important what we're talking about. This is not some minor issue we're covering this uh, week. Jesus died to unite us, to reconcile us, not to divide us. Ephesians 2.16 says this in the TEV translation. By his death on the cross, Christ reconciled us and united different races into one body. He brought us all back to God, ending hostility, ending hostility. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He reconciled us and united all the different kinds of people into one body. In fact, in Ephesians, it says we're a new race together. He brought us all back to God, ending hostility. I love how the Living Bible puts it. This verse, Ephesians 2.16, it says, the feud ended at the cross. The feud ended at the cross. 
there's no place for any kind of bigotry or, or preferential treatment. Finally, number 12, Jesus, write this down, Jesus expects me to work hard at unifying Christians. This is not something for somebody else. If you claim to be a Christian, this is part of your job description. Jesus expects me to work hard at unifying Christians in the church family. Ephesians 4, 3 says this, make every effort, circle that, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Bind yourselves together by living in peace with each other. That's a direct statement from God's word. One day we'll stand before God and he'll say, did you do that? Did you make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit in your church family? Did you bind yourselves together with everybody else to live in peace with each other? I, I wanna share a personal grief with you. And it's this, I am I'm saddened, actually I'm heartbroken that today's Christians are known more for other things than our love for each other. We're not known for what I'm talking about today, what, the God says in his, what God says in his word. You know, if you were to take a survey, go out on the street and ask a thousand people on the street, what do you think of first when you think of a born again Christian? What do you think the answer would be, the number one answer would be? What do you think it would be, the number one answer? What do you think of when you think of a born again Christian? I seriously doubt, if you asked a thousand people, that anyone, anyone would say, man, those guys really love each other. They really, really love each other. That's what we'd be known for. It's the one thing that Jesus wants us to be known for. I think the one thing that Jesus wants us to be known for wouldn't even make the list. That's how off course the contemporary church is today. My brothers and my sisters in our family called Saddleback, we need to practice Philippians chapter one, verse 27, 28. This should be one of our key verses this next year. I love it in the message, it says this, no matter what happens, okay? COVID or not COVID, politics or no politics, uh, riots or no riots, no matter what happens, live in such a way that you are a credit to the good news of Christ. Stand united, stand united, singular in vision, contending for people's trust in the gospel. In other words, caring about what they think about the gospel more than what they think about anything else. Not flinching or dodging in the slightest before the opposition. And then he says this, your courage and your unity will show them, the opposition, what they're up against. Defeat for them, victory for you, and both because of God. Wow. Now in part two of this message, we're going to look at the practical ways that God wants us to implement Christ's vision for us. This is the vision of Christ for you. It's the vision of Christ for our church. So we'll look at the practical steps in the next message, but I wanna close with a couple more verses. And I wanna make a statement that you've probably never thought of before. Here's the statement. Jesus is still waiting for us to be the answer to his prayer. 2,000 years later. Jesus is still waiting for us to be the answer to his prayer. When he prayed that we would be one, that the world would look at the church and goes, man, those people love each other. The subject that was uppermost in his mind as he's getting ready to go to the cross was this, that we, his children, would be unified, that we would defend each other, not criticize each other, that we would love each other, not argue with each other, that we, his family, would model love, that we, his family, would not be divided over secondary issues, but that we would make our allegiance to each other the priority over any other allegiance. You know, Satan hates 
the unity of the church. He hates the unity of Christians. Why? Because the unified church is unstoppable. In the first five chapters of Acts, it talks about Acts and the unity they had in the first church. We will have the power of Acts. We will have the miracle of Acts when we have the unity of Acts. Satan hates the unity of Christians. He's the divider. He's the source of all conflict. Why? Because he knows a divided church is a powerless church. So I want to close this message uh, by echoing a prayer that Paul prayed. And honestly, friends, it, it's my deepest prayer for you. It's my deepest prayer for me. It's our deepest, my deepest prayer for our church family. And by the way, for every other church family too, I pray this. Colossians 2.2 2 in the Living Bible says this, this is what I have asked of God for you that you will be encouraged and knit together by the strong ties of love, by strong ties of love. One day, you're gonna get to heaven and you're gonna stand before God. And he's, he's not gonna ask you, how much money did you make in life? He's not gonna ask you, um, you know, how much education did you get? He's not going to ask you, did you convert anybody to your political views? Who'd you vote for? He's not going to ask that. He's not going to ask, did you enjoy retirement? But it is much more likely that God will ask, did you learn, you really learn, to love your brothers and sisters in my family, even those who didn't agree with you? Did you learn? to love the members of the family who were different to you, different background. You see, my dear friends, what I'm saying today is the bottom line is this. One of the five purposes of life is learning how to really love. And the church is the laboratory for that. It's how we are to practice learning how to really love because we don't do it very good. Nobody teaches you how to really love. But the Bible says without love, I'm nothing. And the Bible also says the only thing that matters is faith expressed through love. So I have to ask myself, as I look at all these verses we've run through, I have to ask myself, is this the top priority in my life? loving other Christians? And I have to urge you to ask yourself that question. Now in part two, as I said, we're gonna look at the practical steps that each of them could take, but I'll end with one other verse, Colossians 3, 14. And in the New Century Version, it says, this is what God says to those of us who are in the family of God. Quote, most important of all, most important of all, love each other. Love is what holds you all together in perfect unity. See, unity is just the visible expression of love. Unity is the visual expression of love. Wat a geweldige, geweldige stelling. And I can amen see op alles wat wat Rick gesê het in hierdie boodskap. Maar kom, ons staan net vir oomlik stil voor ons die dienst afsluit. Al hierdie goed wat ons vanmorgen gehoor het, al twaalf van hierdie punte, is so ontzettend belangrijk in elke gemeente. Het is so ontzettend belangrijk in ons gemeente, en weet jy, dit is ook so belangrijk in ons gesinne en ons families. En ek dink as ons alles hier gehoor het vanmorgen, he, dan besef ons die ergens van die saak. Ons is veronderstel om getuies te wees in die wereld. En Jesus sê dit so mooi, he. hy sê dat, dat wanneer ons united is, wanneer ons een is, sal die wereld na ons kyk en hulle sal glo. En dit is so verskrikkelijk belangrijk. En ons leef in een tyd, wat ek denk soos geen ander tyd van tevore is nie, waar daar so ontzettend, ontzettend baie verdeeldheid is. Daar is verdeeldheid in die wereld en ongelukkig is daar verdeeldheid in die kerk 
van Jesus Christus vandag meer als wat ik in my jylle bestaan ooit gezien het. En die kerk safer daaronder en die witness wat ons veronderstel is om dat te, te, te he, leid daaronder. Ek het hier die week weer uh, een nies gekyk en, 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 en gesien hoe hulle een pastor uh, uitgelig het in Amerika wat verlede zondag een preek gehad het waar hy gesê het dat gij mense moet achter in hulle koppe geskiet word en doodgemaak word. En dit het my hart so geruk om te denk dat een uh, persoon wat die evangelie verkondig voor een gemeente kan staan en dit kan sê oor ander mense en selfs oor ander gelovig is dalk in sy gemeente. En ek het, toe ek daar die klip gesien het op, 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 op die nies, toe denk ek, ja, en wat is die getuienis wat vir die wereld daar doorgegeen word? En daarom mense wil ek, wil ek ernstig vanmorgen vir julle sê, die lewe gaan nie net oor my nie, en die lewe gaan nie net oor ons nie. Ons het een getuienis. Daar is baie mense wat Jesus nie ken nie. Daar is baie mense wat nie vir Jesus leef nie. En as hulle na ons kyk, en hulle sien al die haat, en hulle sien al die verdeeldheid, en al die jaloezie, en al die neid, hoekom sal hulle Jesus wil volg? Hoekom sal hulle Jesus wil dien? En my droom vir ons gemeente vir die toekomst is, dat ons rechtig eens sal wees, dat ons united sal wees in liefde, en dat ons united sal wees in, in dit wat die Heere met ons wil doen, en dier ons wil doen, so dat ons gemeente een getuie vir God sal wees. En nou moet ons weet, die duivel hou nie van eenheid nie. Hy probeer enige, enige, enige iets om eenheid te versteer. Want hy weet, wat daar nie eenheid is nie, wat daar verdeeldheid is, daar werk die gees van God nie. En moet nie dink dat hy nie kinders van die Heere gebruik nie. Baie keer goed bedoelde mense, onwetend, kinders van God, val in een strik van Satan, en hy gebruik hulle om onmin te saai, om skade te doen in die koninkrijk van God. Vooral in die tyd van social media ook, waar het so makkelijk is om op een foon te sit en goed te tik in en op die manier verdeeldheid te saai. Of dier achteraf te wees, of wat ook al. So kom ons, kom ons sê vir mekaar, ons het verlede week vir mekaar gesê, ons is deel van die selfde lichaam van Christus, ons is deel van die selfde wingerd van God. En kom ons sê vir maar vir mekaar, elkeen van ons moet die eenheid in hier die wingerd van God beskerm. Dit is nie net my taak as die pastor en as die leier van die gemeente om hier die eenheid te beskerm nie. Dit is elkeen van jylle wat deel is van hier die gemeente. Het is een belangrike taak om die eenheid van die gemeente te beskerm. En daarom is dit so belangrijk, dat ons die eenheid van ons wingerd so sal beskerm, dat ons nie die duivel sal toelaat om, om, om goed in ons koppe te plant, om ander mense te gebruik, om onmin en, 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 en disunity te kom bring nie. Wat het Riek gesê? Unity is the visual expression of love. So wanneer daar eenheid is in een gemeente, dan wijst dit dat die mense lief is vir mekaar. En weet jy wat glo ek persoonlik? Hoe meer eenheid daar is, hoe liever raak die mense vir mekaar. So mag ek jou vanmorgen challenge, dat jy vanmorgen daar waar jy sit, een commitment sal maak en sal sê, ek gaan my beijver vir die eenheid in ons gemeente. Ek gaan alles in my vermoe doen, om die eenheid te beskerm. En ek gaan sorg dat ek nie een van die sal wees wat verantwoordelijkheid gaan, verantwoordelijk gaan wees vir disunity in die toekomst nie. Mag ek jou ook challenge dat jy sal sê binnen jou gesin en binnen jou persoonlijke familie sal jy die eenheid beskerm en sal jy alles van jou kant af doen om te sorg dat daar eenheid in jou gesin is, eenheid 
in jou familie is, en selfs by jou werk. Maak een commitment vandag en sê, ek gaan nie die probleem wees by die werk nie. Ek sal die een wees, wat liefde wees en liefde gee. Ek denk elkeen van ons het iets om te, te hoor vandag, maar ek denk ook elkeen van ons het een kees om te maak. En ek wil jou challenge, kom ons maak vandag die kees, ons trek een streep in die sand, en ons sê, ek gaan my beijver vereenheid. En ons vraag vir God, dat hy ons sal help om te onderskui, dat ons oe sal oopwees, dat ons sal sien, as die duivel op een slinkse manier kom, en probeer om disunity te bring, en om onmin te saai. Want jy sien, hy kom staan nie recht voor jou, en wees dit vir jou nie. Hy doen dit baie keer so subtiel, so achteraf, dat baie keer val ons vir dit en ons besef dit nie. So kom ons maak daar die kese. Kom ons maak ons oor toe. Heere Jesus, dit is so significant dat dat jy voor jy gekruisig is, bid vir vir jy volgelinge en vir jy kerk dat ons in eenheid met mekaar moet lewe so dat die wereld kan glo. My hart persoonlik, Heere, is baie seer as ek na die wereld en na die kerk en die brewe vandag kyk. Want ons sien hoe baie verdeeldheid daar is. Ons sien hoe baie veroordeling en haatspraak daar is. En ons sien wat dit doen aan die getuie wat, getuien is wat die kerk veronderstel is om in die wereld te hee. En hier ons wil nie deel wees ooit daarvan nie. En as ons in die verlede dag onbewustelik deel daarvan was, enige een van ons, selfs ons gemeente, dan vir ons vermoorde dat jy ons sal vergewe en dit van ons sal verweider. En vanmorgen kom, kom ons en ons besef die ergens van eenheid. Ons besef die ergens van liefde vir mekaar. En Vader, Heere Jesus, ons kom maak een commitment dat ons ons sal beijver vir eenheid vereenheid in ons gemeente, vereenheid in ons gesinne en ons families. En ons vraag heilige gees, maak ons alert vir die, vir die slinkse plannen van die bose. Geef ons discernment en onderscheiding om te kan, te kan sien wanneer hy probeer om ons subtiel te beinvloed om verdeeldheid te bring en verdeeldheid te saai. En Heere, maak ons oor oop vir mense wat van buiten verdeeldheid wil bring binnen in ons midde. En help ons om die kiese te maak, om dit nie toe te laat nie. O Heilige Gees, werk in ons en help ons om dier die oor te kyk, oor Vader, dier die oor te kyk, oor Heere Jesus, na die ander mense met wie ons die lewe deel. Die ander mense met wie ons die winger deel die mense in ons gesinne, die mense met wie ons saamwerk, ons vriende, dat ons mekaar nie dier die wereldse lens sal sien nie, maar dier die oe, en groei ons liefde vir mekaar, en ons liefde vir u. As ons nou uit mekaar uit gaan, vader vraag dat u beskermend in die hand, oor elkeen sal wees, ek vraag jyre Jesus, dat u elkeen sal toevul in u bloed en genade, en ek vraag oor heilige gees, dat die oor elkeen sal kom en elkeen sy leven sal beheer. En ek bid het in Jesus naam. Amen. Dankie dat jy die dienst saam met ons gedeel het en vir al die paas mag die rest van die dag vir jou soms baie lekker wees en mag jou gesin en jou familie jou besonderlik bederf vandag. Geniet die rest van die dag.